Hi and welcome to this Leaving Cert Higher Level Maths Revision video. In this video we're going to go through the 2021 Revision Worksheet 2. Question 1 was on trigonometric functions including calculus. This was a 50 mark question so you have approximately 25 minutes to complete. The weekly revenue produced by a company manufacturing air conditioning using units is seasonal. The revenue in euros can be approximated by this function. So this is a cause function um, where t is the number of weeks measured from the beginning of July and pi over 6 t is in radians. Find the approximate revenue produced 20 weeks after the beginning of July. Give your answer correct to the nearest euro. So the first thing I'd say is when we see a question like this, so any kind of trigonometric function question, and they tell us it's in radians, straight away at that point, I'd suggest that you change your calculator into radian mode. It's really easy to forget. And although it's quite quick to change it, if you've already put in the sum and then change it, you'll lose your sum and have to type it again. With something like this, the sum's quite complicated and can take quite a while to type it in. So this is the most efficient way to work. So what they're basically asking us to do is to work when t is 20. So we're taking our original function or and subbing in 20. Be really, really careful with this notation. This is or of t. So when you see or bracket t, it does not mean or multiply by t. It is a function or of t. So we're used to seeing functions in the form f of x, which means the function f, and then x is the variable. So x is what we are subbing in. In this case, we have or of t. Now, because the question is about revenue, calling the function or rather than f makes perfect sense. And because the variable here is really time, instead of calling that x, we use t. So it's really important across all different types of questions that you're able to recognize this function's notation. What we're doing then is subbing in instead of t, subbing in 20. Again, this is or of 20, not or multiplied by 20. We're subbing into our formula. Make sure your calculator is in radian mode. We get this as an answer. It is 20,658.50817. When we were asked the question, they asked us, please give your answer correct to the nearest euro, which means we're rounding it to the closest whole number. And our final answer is 20,659. Part B, find the values of, uh, of the time T within the first 52 weeks when the revenue is approximately 26,250. Now, when we deal with our functions um, within trigonometry, so our trigonometric functions, um, we need to remember the idea of our rotations. This question did not ask us to graph the functions, but we still need to keep everything in mind that we would have learned when we were talking about the graphs of trigonometric functions. So that idea of 52 weeks is actually quite key. Um, and we're going to see how it will impact in a minute. I'll show you that. Um, when we talk about solving a trigonometric equation, which is what this is, we have to be careful. We're using our unit circle and we're also then looking at any rotations. This kind of question can be asked as a short question in part A or section A, or it can be as part of a longer question like this section B question. So let's set it up. We're basically told we're trying to find the time when uh, the function is equal to 26,250. So we allow the function or of t equal to 26,250. We then need to isolate the trigonometric piece. So usually these are sinusoidal functions. That means sine or cosine. In this case, it's a cosine function. And the reason for that is tan is not a very useful or a nice function um, to work with. There's not a lot they can ask on it. So we tend to see these ones as only sine or cos. You want to focus on getting that cos piece isolated or on its own before we solve it. In the section A questions, we're usually given this isolated. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to take away that 37,500 from both sides. And then we're going to divide both sides by the coefficient. So before the cos, that number there is its coefficient. Dividing by that and simplifying it. And that leaves us with the cos of pi over 6t is equal to negative a half. We need to solve this. Now, 
And like I said, this idea of 52 weeks is really, really important. If we take what the angle is, so pi over 26t, so it's not just cos of x, there's a coefficient there in front of the t, and that will change the period of the function. So that means when we're looking at it, it's not going to rotate in, in 360 degrees or 2 pi for talking radians, like a normal function. And when I say normal function, I mean like cos of x or sine of x. However, if we sub in this 52, you'll find that two, it equals 2 pi. Um, if you're struggling with radians, page 13 in your log tables is really, really helpful to have open because the table on page 13 shows all the degrees and all the radians one over the other. So it helps to kind of do these quick changes in your head. It allows you to kind of think in degrees and work in radians. So my answer is 2 pi. Now, 2 pi is not on page 13, but 180 degrees is pi. That is on page 13. So 2 pi is 2 180s, which is 360 degrees, which means it's one rotation. So what they're basically asking us is to solve this within one full rotation. Now, what that means is when we go and look at our unit circle, I only have to worry about what's in that unit circle. Another thing that would have hinted at that is the fact that they only wanted two values. When we see this question asked in section A, we can often have to get many, many, many answers, sometimes even the general, the general solution, which is a formula to give us any answers. So let's work on solving this. First thing we're going to do is look at our unit circle. In our unit circle, we're going to put in where everything is positive, negative, and so on. I use cast, C-A-S-T. So you could have learned some other way to do it, and that's perfect. What that stands for is in the first quadrant, all are positive. In the second quadrant, sine is positive. Third quadrant, tan is positive. And in the fourth quadr quadrant, <laughs> cos is positive. Now, here we have cos is negative. So when we're dealing with negative, we're talking about either being in the second quadrant or our third quadrant. So we're talking about angles here and angles here. Okay, so if it helps, again, with radians, I would always suggest that if it, if it helps to think in degrees and write degrees and radians both down. So here is zero. Here is 90 degrees, but using page 13, that is actually pi over 2. Uh, this is 180 degrees. Again, using page 13, it's pi. Down here is 270, but again, using page 13, that's 3 pi over 2. It'll just help us figure out our answer. Now, if we want to solve it, we're going to have to use a reference angle. So the reference angle I'm going to allow to be A. This is an acute angle and um, that we'll use to solve the problem. So cos of A, so cos of the reference angle, will be the same answer, but positive. So the cos of A is a half. Our reference angle is always an acute angle, so lower or smaller than 90 degrees, which means the cos or sine of it will all or tan will always be positive. So again, I'm using page 13 and it's just so, so helpful. If you don't use it, I would highly suggest that you start because without even touching my calculator, I've been able to figure out that actually cos of A um, equal to a half, the angle A, if I think in radians from that page, it's pi over three. But what's even more helpful is the fact it also gives me degrees. So it helps me keep it kind of clear in my head if radians are confusing. So A is pi over three. Now that is the angle, the acute angle, the reference angle that we use. It represents this little angle here and this little angle here. So let's talk second quadrant first. So if we're in the second quadrant, um, we would usually do, and again, use your degrees if you need to, our angle will usually be 180 degrees, take away the reference angle. We are actually working in radians, so we'll use pi, take away the reference angle, which is pi over 3, and that should be equal to our full angle, which is pi over 26t. Now, you can substitute there if you prefer. That's absolutely fine. Cleaning this up, and you can use your calculator for all of this cleanup, uh, we get 2 pi over 3. And then final answer, 
Um, you can work this whatever way you want. You can multiply both sides by 26 and then divide both sides by pi. That's absolutely perfect. If you can understand that pi over 26 is the coefficient, you can simply divide by the coefficient. Um, and whichever way you work, we should end up with 52 over 3. And that's our first answer for T. Let's get our second. So in the third quadrant, again, if you want, think in degrees, and um, we would usually do 180 degrees plus the reference angle in radians. That's going to be pi plus pi over three. That's going to equal our angle. Our angle is this one here. So that's pi over 26t. I'm trying to solve for t, so let's clean up that right-hand side. Uh, use your calculator if you have to, that's fine. Uh, 4 pi over 3 is what that simplifies to. Again, whichever way you want to work this, I will divide both sides by pi over 26. Um, and that gives me 104 over 3, which is my second answer for t so i wouldn't uh, change them to decimal because over three means it's going to be um point either three or point six recurring means that anything you cut or however many places you give you are going to have to round it so it's better just to leave it here in fractional form Part C then asks, find or dash of t, the derivative of or of t, um, equal to 22,500 cos of pi over 26t plus 37,500. So the rules for differentiation trigonometric functions are on page 25 of your log tables, uh, but ensure you imply the chain rule. Okay, so we're using cos or we're given cos in our original function, we can see that cos differentiates to minus sine of x. But that's only if it's cos x. Here, it's cos of something a bit more complicated. It's t, that's okay, but it's really the pi over 26 is the problem. So we're going to use a version of the chain rule. The chain rule in simple terms, basically you differentiate it with the rule, and then as a final step, so a final adjust adjustment, you multiply, by the derivative of the inner function. Now in this question, we're getting the derivative of this. That is my inner function. So it's gonna look something like this. We have the 22,500, which was the coefficient that doesn't change. Cos goes to minus sign. So I've just put in a bracket here just to keep that minus from making it look like it's subtracting because it's not, it's still multiplying. So it's minus sign of the angle that doesn't change. And then that last piece here, this is the derivative of the inner function. Now, when we talk about trigonometric functions, we can often think that this just looks like we have taken the coefficient of, in this case, t or x or theta or whatever it is, but it is the derivative. And that's just a very, very slight difference. Um, well, in the majority of questions we see, it's going to be the same thing, but it could be different. It is the derivative of this. If the t was squared, for example, then it wouldn't just be the coefficient. I'm going to tidy up. So I'm going to multiply this by this and bring, um, sorry now, that green's not great to see it. Let me, let me get rid of this green. Let me give you a better green. It's not easier to see. Uh, so we're going to multiply the 22,500 by pi over 26 because they're numbers. Now, don't forget, pi is a number. Pi is 3.14. It's not a variable. It is a constant. So we treat that like we would treat any of our numbers. I'm also going to pull out that minus that's in front of sign. And when we clean it up, it's going to be minus 11,250 pi over 13. Now, the calculator itself won't give you something nice in terms of pi. Um, if it doesn't, you want to put everything into your calculator except pi. So it would be 22,500 multiplied by 1 over 26. And then you put your pi in yourself to make it a little bit nicer looking. The reason I say that is because, again, if we have decimals and we round, we're going to lose some of our accuracy. Okay, so it's minus 11,250 pi over 13 sine of pi over 26t. So part D then says, use calculus to show that the revenue is 
increasing 30 weeks after the beginning of July. So this is a really important idea from calculus, and that is to show that a function is increasing. We show that the first derivative, f dash of x, is greater than zero. Um, so if we wanted to show the opposite, that it's decreasing, it will be less than zero. And when it's equal to zero, that's where we have our min or our max point. So that is where effectively the tangent is flat. So basically what this is saying, where we're saying increasing, we're really talking about where is the slope positive. That's what increasing means. So let's take our derivative we've already worked out and see what number we get when we get, or sorry, when we sub in our 30. Because this um, derivative, it'll be positive or negative depending on where we are. So here we are at t is 30 because it's 30 weeks. So we're going to sub in 30. Um, this is what it looks like, or dash of 30. Um, again, be careful, we are in radians. Your calculator should still be in radians from the start of the question. And we end up with €1,263.44. This is greater than zero, so we can say the revenue is increasing um, because of that fact. So these are some of the key ideas of calculus that you need to remember. Increasing, like I said, an easier way to think about that is the idea of it being positive slope. So part E, find a value for the time t within the first 52 weeks when the revenue is at a minimum. Use or double dash t, so the second derivative, to verify your answer. Okay, so to get a minimum or a maximum point, okay, both is the same method, we let f dash of x equal zero. That is again got to do with the idea of slope. f dash of x, so our first derivative always means slope. At those minimum and maximum turning points, we end up with um, a tangent that's flat, so that is zero slope. So we use that to find our minimum or maximum point. So we let f dash of x equal zero. To verify then that the point is a minimum, we use the second derivative, and that is where it's greater than zero. Now that might seem counterintuitive, but a good way to remember this is if you think about your positive quadratic, that has a minimum point. So when we talk about the second derivative being positive, we're talking about a minimum point. The opposite is also true. When the second derivative is negative, that means we're at a maximum point. Think again, your negative quadratic only has a maximum point. So let's take our first derivative, which we've already worked out, and let that equal zero. Now, when you want to work um, with anything equal to zero, it means this number here, let me get my highlighter. It could be zero, but actually it can't because it is a value. So then the only other thing that we're multiplying by to make it zero is that sign of pi over 26t. Now, you can also get rid of that um, coefficient by multiplying and dividing, but because there's a zero on the other side, you'll end up with the same answer. Now, Again, I'm using page 13 because I find this so much easier than using my calculator um, when, when I can. We won't always be able to do it, but when I can. Um, so here is the page 13 that I've been looking at. And I want to see, well, where are, where are the two places uh, where sine is zero? So there's one here and one here. So you can see it's zero degrees or since we're working in radians, zero radians or 180 degrees or pi radians. Now, so there are my two answers. Um, the first one is quite straightforward. It means, well, it doesn't matter what um, number is put in front of it. If we multiply by t and we get zero, then t must be zero. Um, our second one gives me t equals 26 weeks. Now, given the way that they've asked this, it's within the first 52 weeks and given like the idea of revenue, we'd expect that t equals 26, that that is the correct answer. Now, if you want to double check, you can sub in both of these values, but I'm going to focus on t equals 26 because it is within the first 52 weeks. 
To verify this using my second derivative, I need to take my first derivative and I need to differentiate again. I'm gonna again go back to my log tables. Page 25 has my differentiation rules. This time I'm differentiating sine and sine will go to cos. Again, I just need to be careful about that chain rule. It's not as simple as just changing the sine to cos. I also need to make sure that I multiply by the derivative of the inner function, which is the derivative of this thing here, pi over 26t. So we're going to just have minus 11,250 pi over 13 cos pi over 26t. So that's just sign changes to cos. There's no sign change sign s-i-g-n there's no sign change here and then we multiply by the derivative of the inner function which again i know it looks like it's just the coefficient but it is the derivative of pi over 26 t so what i mean by that is you apply the rule bring down your power take one away from the power so we're left with pi over 26 i'm again going to focus in on um getting a simplified answer so there's my constant and my constant again if you're struggling to get a nice answer in terms of pi leave the pi out and put it back in yourself at the end here is what I've got minus 562 sorry 5625 pi squared over 169 cos of pi over 26 t I want to verify my answer. So remember that t equals 26. So I'm going to do or double dash of 26. So in my 26 into what we've just worked out. Again, just be careful. Your calculator is in radians. It shouldn't change. Um, but calculate in radians. Put that in and we get 328.5. We're trying to verify that that was a minimum point. We've done that because my answer for the second derivative is greater than zero. So therefore, uh, 26 weeks is when the revenue is at a minimum. Question two is a coordinate geometry of the circle question and it is 25 marks, so you have approximately 12 minutes to complete. Part A, the point minus 2k is on the circle, x minus 2 squared plus y minus 3 squared equals 65. Find two possible values of k where k is an element of z. So there is a very important fact that you should know and that is that if a point is on a line or on a circle or on a function, when we sub it into the equation, it will balance, okay? It will work. So the left-hand side will equal the right-hand side. So we're going to sub this in. So this is not just about the circle. This works for a line. It works for a function. Uh, here is the point minus 2k. I'm going to sub in for x and y. So my x value is minus 2 and my y value is k. So I get minus 2 minus 2 squared plus k minus 3 squared equals 65. I'm going to tidy that up at minus 2 minus 2. That's negative 4. I'm going to square that. Squaring out my bracket, k minus 3, I square the first, k squared, twice the first by the second or double the first by the second or whatever way you want to say it, k by minus 3, that's minus 6k. And then square the last. So minus 3 squared is plus 9. That equals 65. Squaring out minus 4, just be careful. Uh, minus by minus is a plus. So that gives us a positive 16. Now we want to tidy up all of those constants. So there's a 16 and a 9. And then we'll take away a 65 from both sides. And that ends up with a negative 40. So our quadratic equation is k squared minus 6k minus 40. And um, it makes sense for us to have a quadratic because when the question was asked, it asked us for two possible values of k. So if you weren't expecting it, this is our hint that actually quadratic, this makes sense that we got a quadratic. I'm going to use guide number. My guide number is minus 40. Factors of minus 40, that adds to give me minus 6 and minus 10 plus 4. Because it starts with an x squared, I can use the shortcut for guide number and just plug those two uh, factors straight into the bracket. So I get x plus 4, x minus 10, which gives us two answers of k equals negative 4 and k equals 10. A lovely, nice, easy, straightforward question. 
Part B, the circle S in the first quadrant touches both the x-axis and the y-axis. The line T, 3x minus 4y plus 6 equals 0 is, uh, is a tangent to S as shown. Find the equation of S. Now, this diagram was given, and it's not a fantastic diagram, and it can be um, a little bit confusing as we get towards the answer, but it does give us a very good indication of how to start. When we've seen this kind of question with the, the idea of the tangents, we've seen it with sample papers with no diagram. Um, and the first thing I'd always suggest is that you draw a diagram. So the fact that they've given us a diagram in this makes it so much easier to work. There's a key idea you need to know here, and that is when either the x or y axis or both are tangents, it's telling us something. And what it's telling us here is basically its distance. So if I look at my um, diagram, the fact that that's um, the fact that the x axis is a tangent means this is a radius and this is a radius. So therefore, this is or and this is or. Therefore, my center point must be or or. Now, that logic will be true no matter which quadrant we're in. We just have to watch the signs. So that is key. If one or both of the tangent or both of the axes are tangents, that will tell us either the x coefficient, well, the x coordinate or the y coordinate of the center point. Here we have both, so it tells us both of these are or. So think of that. That's a key idea. Now we're asked to find the equation of s. So let's look at our log tables. And in our log tables, we have um on page 19, a little few um, formula for the circle. So if I want to work with the circle, or if I want to basically find the equation, I need two things. I need a center point and I need a radius. So where I'm seeing that is, I want to center HK and a radius or, and then I can make the equation. So I have, my uh, center point in terms of or and then I can think of my radius as well. Now we were given an extra piece of information and that was the idea of our tangent. Now what's important to remember is once we're given a tangent we know that we can draw in a radius to the tangent that will be perpendicular. So like this. Now why does it matter that it's perpendicular? Oh, and um, Because now we know that we can use another formula um, and that formula is on the top of page 19. So it's the perpendicular distance formula because now we know that the distance between this point, the center point, and this line here is equal to R. Now that might feel like we don't have a lot of information and we don't, but because we know the center in terms of or, technically, although we don't know the center and we don't know the radius, there's still only one unknown because we know the center in terms of or. So we're going to continue using with this formula with our or um, radius and our center or or. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to label this line AX plus BY plus C. So A is 3, B is minus 4, C is 6. When I sub that in, um, I'm going to use my point or, or, which is x1, y1, and that should all be equal then. So the distance, think of what this is doing. The distance between this point and this tangent is or. That's what we're saying. So this formula will equal or. It's going to look like this. So 3 times or minus 4 times or plus 6, all in modulus or absolute value signs, all over square root of 3 squared plus minus 4 squared, and that will equal or. So the distance between our center point and the tangent is equal to the radius or. So again, we don't have the center, we don't have the radius, but because they're all in terms of or, we've now got an equation that we can solve that only has one unknown. So let's work 
through this. We're going to simplify the top line. 3 or minus 4 or plus 6. That's going to be minus or plus 6. The square root of 3 squared plus minus 4 squared, that is 5. Make sure you use your brackets or you will get an error. And that all equals or. Now, multiplying both sides by the denominator, we end up with absolute value of minus or plus 6 is equal to 5 or. Now we have a modulus equation and we can deal with this in two different ways. We can either square both sides, end up with a quadratic and solve. That's probably the most straightforward and I suppose the easiest to remember. The second way we can work is the shortcut, which says, well, maybe minus or plus 6 is positive maybe minus or plus six was negative and we changed it to positive. So we can get our two answers that way. I'm going to be a little bit clever. So this is really, if you're aiming, you know, for the top marks, and I, and I often say this, it's really about trying to do and save as much time as possible in some questions. So I'm going to show you how you can just shave at 30 seconds off this question. So I'm going to go back to my diagram and the tangent. One thing, and I suppose this is why it's so important when we have a diagram and spotting key points. So for me, a key point on the tangent is this idea of six. It's the constant, so it represents the y-intercept. Now, why is that important? Well, here's my radius. So I marked or here earlier. So or is smaller than six. It has to be has to be. Even if that diagram is not drawn to scale, the fact that the constant is 6 has to be smaller. So if I look at minus or plus 6, if or is smaller than 6, if we have a negative number smaller than 6, so like negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, and we have a plus 6, what's going to be in there will definitely be positive. So at a very, very quick glance of that, I know that minus or plus 6 is positive. So I only have to worry about that equal to 5 or. I can effectively drop their modulus sign. So I can go straight to this. That's it. Now, are you going to waste um, a lot of time going the other ways? No, not a huge amount. But again, every second counts if you're really aiming towards the top grades. So now if I work this through, I end up with or equals one. Now, I like the shortcut. So the shortcut is, so I'm going to show you the longer way, because if you're kind of there going, I wouldn't have seen that idea. I wouldn't have been looking for that. That's fine, right? But I'm going to show you, um, but I'm going to show you using the shortcut. You'll get these two same answers if you squared both sides and worked that way. So this is what was in the modulus sign was positive, but maybe it was negative and we changed it to positive. This is before I, I've worked through the logic. It's before we decided for sure it was positive. So minus or plus six equals minus five or. Bringing that over, plus five or minus or. That's four or equals minus six. And we get or is equal to minus 1.5 or minus three over two. And that obviously cannot be true. That cannot be valid because or is a length of a radius. So the length can never be negative. Now, if you work the quadratic answer or if you work the quadratic way squaring both sides, you would have got both of these as or values. And again, you would have discounted the negative. So by spotting what I was discussing with the picture, it just stops you doing this second piece and getting that second incorrect answer for or. Now that I have an answer for or, it means I also know my center because I have a center 1, 1 because uh, remember the center was or, or. Now I'm going back to my log tables here on page 19 and again that's the formula I'm using so I'm going to label my center is hk and my radius is or. Let's sub in and simplify. So equation S, I'm going to sub in H is 1, K is 1, so I end up with X minus 1 squared plus Y minus 1 squared equals 1. Expanding my brackets, I get X squared minus 2X plus 1, so that's square the first, twice the first by the second, square the last, or you can say double in the middle, whatever way you want to work it. And then Y minus 1 squared, square the first, Y by minus 1, then double it, minus 2Y plus 1 equals 1, tidying that up, and we get x squared plus y squared minus 2x minus 2y plus 1 equals 0. And that is our equation for s. 
Question three is a financial maths question. Um, it was from a section B, so it's 50 marks. So you'll have approximately 25 minutes to complete. Part A. Ava plans to borrow 60,000. I'm just going to highlight some key things as we're working through. Um, she plans to borrow 60,000 from her bank to start a new business. The annual percentage rate, APR of the loan, is 5.6% fixed for the term of the loan, so it won't change. She agrees to repay the loan in equal annual repayments over six years, with the first repayment due one year after the loan is issued. Using amortization, find the amount of each annual repayment A, correct the nearest cent. So this is the amortization formula. Now, this particular question pointed us in that direction, but in an exam paper, it may not do that. This amortization formula is for loans and mortgages. Remember, a mortgage is just a special type of loan. So here's our formula here. A is the annual repayments, and we have P for principal, that's our 60,000. We have I, which is the interest rate. It's important that all interest rates go in in decimal in any of these formulas. And then T, which is time, which is six years. So let's write those down. P is 60,000, I is 5.6%, or in decimal, 0.056. T is 6, and now we're just going to sub into our formula. So it is A equals P 60,000, I 0 0.56, 1 plus I is 1 plus 0 0.056, to the power of T, which is our time, which is 6, and under the line, 1 plus 0 0.056 to the power of 6 minus 1. This can go straight into your, for, into your calculator if you're struggling with that. Um, 60,000 in front, you can use a bigger bracket here, or it can sit on the top line, um, or you can use a multiplication sign. Our answer when we do that is 12,048.83481, and it keeps going. We've been asked to get this to the nearest cent, so we're going to round that. That's 12,048 euro and 83 cent. Part um. 2 of A, complete the table below to show the repayment schedule and the balance of the loan at the end of each of the final three years of the term of the loan. Okay, so a schedule of payments, what we're basically doing is breaking the payment down into the interest portion and the loan portions, so the principal amount. So when you pay back your loan, you're actually not paying back the principal, you're paying part of it towards the interest, and that's the important piece, that's the bit that's taken first, Whatever is left then goes towards the principal. So let's fill in the fixed annual amount because we know that that's not going to change and we've just worked that out. So we're just working with the last three years of this six year loan. So we've just worked out that amount. Now, the interest, how we work out the interest is we're going to get, and I'm going to put a little one in here so we can uh, follow and I won't work out everything, but I'll work um, to show you how interest is done. And then you'll get the same answer in the next two lines. So for our interest, we're getting 5.6% of what's left of the loan. And this is what's left of the loan. So we're going to multiply by 32,446.5. And that gives us our 1,081701. So the interest piece, like I said, is always done first. So when we make this repayment, 1,817 and one cent is going towards interest. The remainder then goes towards the principal part. So basically, I'm going to take my um my payment amount, which is 12,048 and 83 cent, and take away the bit that I've already kind of put aside for interest, and that will leave me what bit is left to go towards the principal of the loan. So actually reducing the value. So that's how we got that one there. Then the third one, so this third piece here, what we're going to do is we're going to have our old balance, so this balance here, take away our new balance here, or sorry, well, 
our all balance take away the portion we paid so this part is what we paid towards that principal and taking those two numbers away give us 22,214 euro and 72 cent and now we do the same thing again the interest in this case is going to be 5.6 percent of where I've labeled number three. So it's always the interest of the balance, okay? So the newest balance we have, that means we are gonna have a little bit less interest. And the reason we have a little bit less interest is because we have a little bit less to pay on our loan. So at the end of year three, there was 32,000 owed. Well, nearly 32,500 owed. By the end of year four, there's 22,000 owed. So that reduction in balance means a reduction in interest. The reduction in interest means I'm still making the same payment, so there's more to go towards the principal. So as the interest portion goes down, the principal, so the bit going towards the principal, is going up. And that's going to leave us with €11,409.91. And doing the same thing again, we end up with three cent off. Now, the reason we're down three cent is because of the rounding we would have done on that fixed annual repayment. But obviously we had to round it because money only goes to two decimal places. Well, euro does anyway. So um, that three cents, so maybe it's written off by the bank. Maybe they take it in the last payment. Uh, will we quabble over three cent? Mm, who knows? So part B. A financial advisor has told Ava that she could save money by repaying the loan monthly. Under this repayment schedule, the APR charged is also 5% fixed for the term of the loan. The loan will be repaid in equal monthly repayments at the end of each month and the term of the loan would remain unchanged. Show that the rate of interest compounded mon monthly, which is equivalent to the APR of 5.6%, is 0.4551%, correct to four decimal places. Now, when we're asked to do this, to find the equivalent rate, it's actually a version of this compound interest formula that we see on page 30 of your log tables. Now, when I say a version of it, uh, because basically what we want to see is if we invest or if we borrow, so you can think of it from our point of view or the bank's point of view, if we invest the same amount for the same duration of time, regardless of whether it's compounded monthly or compounded yearly, we should end up with the same interest. Now, I know that kind of contradicts what's being said in part B, but that's got to do with the repayments, so making repayments. But if you just think of a fixed amount that is set into um, a savings or deposit account, if it was compounded monthly or compounded yearly with no change, we should end up with the same amount. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use I for my annual interest rate and or for my monthly interest rate. So if I invest any amount of my annual rate for one year, it should be the same as investing for the monthly um, rate or for 12 months. So I'm using the I plus, sorry, one plus I to the power of T part of this formula. Now, if you wanted to put any number in front, you'd put the same number on both sides and they would effectively cancel or, yeah, cancel off or you could divide them from both sides. So we could take any number there. So we are just left with this piece. You need to remember this or at least how to get to this point. This was a mock question, but there was 10 marks going for this. Um, we do see that in the more recent years, this question is given in a show rather than a calculate because the next parts do depend on having this answer. So even if you get this part wrong or if you're not able to do it, you still have the answer to continue on the next part. So let's sub in. I is 5.6%, but we always put them in in decimals in these formulas. So we get 1 plus 0 0.056 is the same as 1 plus or to the power of 12. Um, I'm going to bring over my or to the left hand side. So I'm going to flip the whole equation. So I have 1 plus or to the power of 12 is equal to 1.056. To get rid of that power of 12, we're going to do the opposite. You can use your indices there. I'm going to use my roots. I'm going to use the 12th root. So 1 plus or is equal to the 12th root of 1.056. Now, I'm not a big fan of working with decimals, so I'm going to leave it in this form and get or on its own and to get my final answer. So I'm going to take away one from both sides to get or. I then put it into my calculator. 
This is what I get, 0.00455100. It wants um, four decimal places, but that's percentage. So we're going to leave it to six. So cleaning it to six gives me 0 0.004551, which is 0.4551% correct to two decimal places. QED is just saying we've done what was asked. We've shown what they've asked us to show. Find the amount of each monthly repayment correct to the nearest cent. So again, we're going to use the amortization formula on page 31 of the log tables. Notice that when we look at the log tables, they tell us that A is the annual repayment amount. Now, it is OK to use this formula for monthly repayments as long as the interest rate and the time period reflect what you're working with. So as long as our interest rate is monthly and our time is then measured in months, then it's absolutely perfect to use this formula. Our P is still 60,000. Our interest rate is now reduced. It's what we've confirmed from part I. It is 0.4551%. Don't forget that this has to be in decimal. It's really easy to forget to put it in decimal when the percentage is so small, but take care with that. T is equal to 72 months, so we're still six years. Each year is 12 months, so it's 72 months. So we into our formula, it will look like this. 60,000, I is 0 0.004551. One plus I to the power of T. One plus 0 0.004551 to the power of 72. And the denominator, 1 plus 0 0.004551 to the power of 72 minus 1. This whole thing can go into the calculator. Again, just be careful with that 60,000. It can go on the top line or you can use brackets or a multiplication sign. When we do that, we're going to get 979, sorry, 979 euro uh, 0 0.184190. We want our answer here correct to the nearest cent. So we're going to round to two decimal places and our final answer then is 979 euro and 18 cent. Part three, how much would Eva save over the term of the loan by repaying the loan monthly? Give your answer correct to the nearest euro. So our annual repayments, we have 12,048.83. Our monthly repayments, 979 euro and 18 cent. The total repaid from our annual repayments will be that amount multiplied by six because it's over six years. And that gives us 72,292 euro and 98 cent. For our monthly repayments, again, it is over six years. However, it's monthly. So there will be a total of 72 repayments. When we multiply our answer by 72, we get 70,500 um, euro and 96 cent. Our difference is then taking those two away, 1,792 euro and two cent. Part C. Eva's family have offered her an interest-free loan of 60,000 on the condition she repays the loan in one lump sum at the end of four years. Okay, so we're still working with that 60,000, so now we're looking at four years. Eva accepts the offer and decides to invest X euro per month, so some amount, into a fund that will earn her an interest rate um, a monthly interest rate of 0.2%. She plans to use the fund to repay the loan at the end of the loan term. Her first payment is due one month after she receives the loan. Use the sum of geometric series to find the amount of each monthly payment X correct to the nearest cent. So let's draw this out. This is what the time period will look like. She wants to save at monthly intervals so that at the end she has 60,000, which will allow her to repay the loan she took from her family. So when we look at this, we don't know the repayments. However, we were told that the repayments start one month after the start. So it's important to remember that you either have um, a payment at the start or a payment at the end. And never both. So here we have a payment within one month. So we don't have it at the very start. We have one month later. So it means we have a payment there at the very end. We're working towards the money here on the right, which means we're moving into the future, which means we're using the future value. We're over four years with monthly payments. So we have 48 payments and the interest rate of 0.2% is 0.002 in decimal form. We're going to use the 
future value formula, the compound interest formula from your log tables. So each piece of the payments she makes will be subjected to interest. So the first payment will have sat in that account for nearly all that four years. It will be one month short. So instead of having 48 months of interest, it will only get 47. So to show how, how much interest she gets, we'll do one plus i to the power of t, which is one plus 0 0.02 to the power of 47 for that particular payment. That simplifies to 1.002 to the power of 47. The next payment will have 46 months in which to get interest. Then we do some dot, dot, dots, and we get to our second last payment that is left for simply one month. And our last payment does not get any interest at all because that is made as we're taking the money back out. So now we need to understand this as a geometric series. So to do that, we're going to look at what's called the common ratio. That is what do you multiply each term by to get to the next. And this is 1 over 1.002. Um, we are going to use this SN, sum of a, generic, a geometric series. That's what we were told to use. And we need some values to plug into this. So the first is A, the first term, that is X times 1 1.002 to the power of 47. The next is OR, which is the common ratio, 1 over 1 1.002. And then N, the number of payments, which is 48. Be careful, it's not 47. There are still 48 payments, just one of them is not um, there long enough to get any interest. Sometimes students like to work backwards. So to make it, I suppose, a little bit easier, you could flip this series. That's absolutely fine if you want to start at X and work up. I think it's much clearer to work as the problem shows us, even though it leaves us with a fraction. But remember that fraction, we can easily work with it on our calculator. So now let's plug that into our SN formula. We're doing S48. When we do that and plug everything in, we know it should equal 60,000 or we want it to equal 60,000. Remember, Ava wants to save enough to pay back that loan she got from her um, family. So we want all of this to add 60,000, which means this has now given us the equation to get X. Now, the easiest way to work with this, in my opinion, is to focus in on everything except the X. So I've literally taken everything here except the X. Because everything is multiplied, I can work with this. I'm going to put that into my calculator and I'm going to get that in decimal form. When I do, my answer is 50.32676843. Um, X times that number will give me 60,000. So to figure out X, I'm going to divide both sides by 50.32676843. That then gives me a final answer of 1192.208475, which we want correct to the nearest cent. That's what we were asked in the question. So we want to round that to two decimal places, which gives us a final answer of 1,192 euro and 21 cent. Part two, Ava fails to consider dirt tax in her calculation. Dirt tax is deducted at a rate of 33% from the interest earned in the fund. How much should Ava increase her monthly payments by in order to repay the full loan at the end of the loan? term. Okay, so basically what we're going to do is go back and review the question that we have just done in part I. DIRT stands for deposit interest retention tax, so it doesn't really need that second tax there, but it doesn't matter um, if you know what that means or not. Really, all that matters is it's taking a portion of the interest that you earn. The government will always take a portion of all money that you earn regardless of how you earn it. So first thing I'm going to do is going to understand, well, what would be the effective rate? So the tax is at 33% of the interest. So you have to pay over 33% of your interest. So effectively, what that means is instead of the 2%, well, the 0.2% monthly that we thought we were getting, we're only allowed to keep 67% of that because 33% of that goes to tax. So what is 67% of 0.02%? Well, 
of means multiply, putting that into the calculator that gives us 0 0.134 percent or 0 0.00134. So in the previous question, everywhere we had 0 0.002 for our interest rate, we're now going to replace it with 0 0.00134. So this is replacing the interest rate we had. So replacing the 0 0.2 two percent okay because we don't get to keep it all so it's not true to say that that is the interest rate that Ava was getting so I'm going to do the exact same question but now when I look at it I'm going to instead of 0 0.002 I have one sorry 0 0.00134 so my um, extra piece that I've put on here x multiplied by it's usually 1 plus the interest rate and it was 1.002 now it's 1.00134 to the power of 47 we'll continue exactly like we had continued this um now we're back to our sn we have our or notice that the or has changed because again of that 0 0.02 has now been replaced when we sub in, again, looks very similar to what we had. It's just that 0 0.002 has changed. I'm going to work this exactly the same way, pulling out my x in front because we're multiplying. So everything else I'm going to put into my calculator. That will give us a slightly smaller answer than we would have got in part i. We got 50 point something in part i. Here we get 49.543-ish. Um, and again, to get my x, I'm going to divide 60,000 by that number. That gives me 1,211 0.0. 0.06793 correct to two decimal places or correct to the nearest cent 1211 and 7 cent the question was how much should Ava increase her monthly payments by in order to repay the full loan at the end of the loan term so we need to understand the difference between this amount and what we said in part i the difference when we calculate it um, works out as 18 euro and 86 so she needs to increase her monthly payments by 18 euro and 86 cents in order to account for the extra tax um, that's coming out of what she earns so she can pay back that 60,000 to her family at the end of four years.